so what happens in in non-conductors if we use a simplified picture of atoms uh, we can actually derive a great deal of information about how epsilon depends on and the index of refraction depends on the frequency with which you're driving the material so um, we're going to imagine that uh, a very simple model where we have um, an electron attached to some kind of spring to a massive nucleus uh, the nucleus is going to stay still it's so massive uh, the electron has mass m we have a um, a distance y that the electron is from the nucleus. There's uh, three forces it's going to experience. The first is the binding force. So the total force, so M A is equal to the binding force, which is going to be, um, let's see, you could write that out as KY, where K is a spring constant, or I'm going to write it out this way, minus M omega naught squared Y, where omega naught is equal to the square root of K over M. That's the natural resonant frequency of the spring. Then we have the damping force, which is minus m times gamma um, times the derivative of y um, with respect to time. m gamma y dot. And then we have the driving force, which is the frequency pushing this electron away from the nucleus or towards it, depending on its, its uh, current state, which is going to be q times the electric field the electric field is just E naught cosine omega t. Okay, so uh, we rearrange terms and we get this equation, which should be instantly recognizable as a as a, um, a spring equation. So we have m y double dot plus m gamma y dot uh, plus m omega naught squared y is equal to q. E naught cosine omega t. Now we're going to put on our big boy pants and we're going to uh, work with the um, complex numbers rather than uh, rather than um, uh, real numbers. And so y is just going to be the real of the complex of y, and that's going to be true for pretty much anything we talk about in a complex sense. The real is the actual physical uh, value that we can measure. So we're going to change this to m y complex w dot plus m gamma y complex dot plus m omega naught squared y complex is equal to q e uh, naught i to the omega t. There we go. Much easier to deal with. The solution um, is y complex is equal to y naught complex e to the i omega t. So it's going to vibrate at the same frequency that you drive it up. Minus omega t. I minus. Do I have a minus up there? I should have a minus up here as well. Okay. Um, when we plug this in to this thing up here, we get this y naught has to be equal to uh, q, q over m. Q is the charge of the electron divided by omega naught squared minus omega squared minus i gamma omega times e naught. Okay, so that's the position. Um, that's the maximum of that position. You'll notice that there's an i in the bottom here. That means that um, there is a complex, there's an out of, there's a phase shift between uh, the y and the e field that's driving it. Uh, the dipole moment P, not the momentum, but the dipole moment P. What are we doing here? That has to equal Q, Y. These are complex. P is complex. The real of P complex is the actual uh, dipole moment. Uh, that's just Q squared over M and that mess times E naught. Okay. Um, uh, I, E naught I minus i omega t. All right, uh, then we have uh, the observation that when r omega is very small, when omega is much less than the resonant frequency, so this term dominates, and you get the, um, the phase angle is going to be tan minus 1 
of this mess. Gamma omega divided by omega naught minus omega squared. So when you plug in um, omega that's much smaller than omega naught, then this term dominates and you end up with, you know, omega over omega naughts, which is basically zero. You're basically getting the, the phase constant is zero. That, that makes sense. When you have a spring and you're driving it with a very slow frequency, it's going to move with whatever you're driving it with. There's not, there's not any phase shift at all. Um, it's like somebody grabbing a guitar string and pushing and pulling it back and forth. But when omega is much greater than the resonant frequency, then the phase shift approaches, it's almost equal to pi. Okay, You can see that because it'll be basically uh, gamma over omega, which is basically zero. So. The next uh, observation is that if we have, you, you might notice or remember that w when you excite um, certain materials, it, it not only expels one frequency, but multiple frequencies. Um, so we can represent that by pretending there's multiple electrons connected to a nucleus with various springs and various damping constants, uh, gamma. So we can represent the polarization of a material. Um, polarization of material is different than the polarization of the wave. The polarization of the wave tells you which direction the E-field is pointing. The polarization of the material says this is, this is the induced E-field within the material caused by the external E-field. So we get, that's equal to the number of molecules, number of molecules, yes, the number of molecules, uh, Q squared, that's the charge of the electron squared, divided by the mass of the electron, okay, times this complex bit, J, so it has, it's going to have J distinct uh, resonant frequencies. For each of those, there's a certain number of electrons, one, two, three, four, whatever, um, and then each of those has its own resonant frequency and its own damping constant. Okay, and all that's multiplied by complex E. Okay, and so this is the equation that will give you everything. It will give you all the different, uh, you know, uh, things that it will resonate at. So let's, let's analyze this. Um, let's, let's look at what happens to our epsilon, our index of refraction, things like that. Okay, so we drive the electric field into the, the material. Um, these are the equations that we get from it. We get epsilon times mu naught times d squared of E vector complex divided by dt squared. And we get the same solution as before. And I should write this way. E vector complex of x comma t is equal to E naught vector. Uh, um, vector, uh, not, not a vector, complex, e to the i kappa x minus omega t, except for now our kappa is actually complex, okay? In non-conducting material, we now have behavior that mimics somewhat what happens in conducting material. Uh, so we can break this down. Um, our kappa is some um, real part, the plus, plus some imaginary part, the minus, okay? And when you when you plug this in, you get that this is equal to e naught um, e to the minus i kappa minus x. That's the it's the attenuation. That's how well the material absorbs it. E to the i kappa plus x minus omega t. This is the actual waviness. Okay, so this is the wave, and this is the attenuation. Okay, and um, oh, kappa is also the square root of epsilon, which is complex, um, u naught times omega. Remember, epsilon depends on omega. It's also complex. It's out of phase. Um, so if we were talking about the intensity, we would take E squared. And so we would have our attenuation. Um, a good number would be, you know, um, e to the 3, basically. Um, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, basically, uh, 
one third happens when we have um, alpha. We we're going to call that absorption constant. We're just going to define that as two kappa minus. Okay, that's the absorption constant. Coefficient. See, this is what happens when I stay up late at night. The index of refraction depends on the frequency. That's the kappa plus part that we have there. And that's just going to be n is equal to the speed of light divided by omega times kappa plus. Okay. Um, remember that our kappa plus and our kappa minus have nothing to do with the conductivity of the material. We're not dealing with conductive material. You, you, you're not going to see a current flow through with some conductivity. It has zero conductivity. It doesn't happen. However, when you're driving it with a the frequency, these springs will actually absorb um, some of the energy uh, the damp, the, the energy will be spent all in the damping. It'll just be lost through damping. So that's what's happening here. But it, be, it looks a little bit like um, what happens in the conductors, which is why we did conductors first. Um, we use an approximation. Square root of 1 plus x is about equal to 1 plus 2x. So it's about equal to 1 plus 2x. Yeah, 1 half x. It's a good approximation there. Uh, then we plug in our values for epsilon, and uh, we get the following. These are long equations, so excuse me while I write out. So kappa is about equal to omega over c um, times the square root of epsilon over epsilon naught. That's a terrible epsilon at the top there. Which ends up being about equal to uh, omega over c times the quantity 1 plus n q squared over 2 m epsilon naught okay times the different frequencies number of electrons per frequency it resonant, resonant frequency minus omega squared minus its own damping okay that's kappa our index of refraction is the real Part of that, which ends up being about equal to 1 plus n q squared over 2 m epsilon naught, sum j of the same thing except for we're multiplying the top by omega j squared minus omega squared. Where did that come from? Do the math. You'll, you'll see it. Plus gamma j omega squared. See that i is gone. Um, then our alpha, our absorption coefficient, becomes um, that's just two times kappa to the minus, which is about equal to um, n q squared over two m epsilon naught times the sum j, same thing, except for we have f j times gamma j at the top, divided by omega j squared minus omega squared plus gamma j squared omega squared. Once again, no. Uh, imaginary number in there so it's not complex. So um, normally what happens is when you're near one of those absorption points, those, those uh, absorption frequencies, um, if, if you're not on top of it you'll see that it, the graph takes on a, a almost linear behavior but as you get closer and closer to it it's obvious that it's not a line. So um, what he graphs is this. It, you go to the book and look at the graph he has in the book. Uh, one graph is the index of refraction minus one, so the deviation from um, a vacuum. The other is the absorpt absorption coefficient. You'll see that what happens is the absorption is basically zero everywhere except for around that frequency, in which case it spikes. The index of refraction um, far away from that point looks like a straight line, but as you get closer and closer to it, uh, it turns into this weird inverting um, loop. Okay. Now, if you stay away from those resonant frequencies, and that's all you're working in, you're, you're ignoring those, then you can just drop that whole term. You can drop this whole term here and here. So your n would be looking like this. n would be equal to 1 plus n q squared over 2 m epsilon naught is about equal to um, sum of j, sum over j, 
number of electrons times just the frequency difference squared. Okay, and that's if you stay away. from all the omega j's. Um, for most materials, the natural resonant frequencies are spread out all over the place, and I encourage you to look at the wonderful, beautiful graphs that you can find in your nuclear physics lab. Um, it's, um, well, not nuclear physics, but uh, optics lab. For most of the stuff that's transparent, there's a, an absorption um, frequency that's very close uh, to the visible light in the, in, in the ultraviolet range. And so for those materials, um, um, omega is smaller than the absorption frequency in the ultraviolet. The ultraviolet is very fast. Um, and so we can, we can expand this denominator here to become um, this simple version. So 1 over omega j squared minus omega squared can be expanded to look like um, 1 over omega j squared which is constant, uh, times 1 plus omega squared over omega j squared. Okay? And did I do that right? So n becomes an even simpler thing. Um, it has three terms. So n uh, on, becomes 1 plus nq squared over 2m epsilon naught times the sum over j of the number of electrons divided by the, the absorption frequency squared. This is first term, second term, and the third term is, in, is omega squared times the sum over j of the number of electrons that have the absorption frequency of that to the fourth power. So you get those, those three nice terms. Um, when your lambda is about um, if you if you want to rewrite this in terms of the wavelength lambda, lambda being of course two pi c over omega, then you get this nice little formula. Let me write it on a new page. I should have done this on a new page. I'm sorry. Um, N is one plus a times one plus b over lambda squared. Okay, and this is called Cauchy's equation. Uh, a is the coefficient of refraction, and B is the coefficient of dispersion. So much like when you, you hit a boundary between two materials, except for in this case, the material itself absorbs or, or uh, disperses the, um, the wave frequency. This is not the complete story. There's a lot of details that we skipped. Um, there's a discussion in the beginning about why we can do this at all, why we can assume that it behaves like a spring. Um, the long and short of it is that although this is, this is a lot of hand-waving, um, it, it tends to work. It explains what's happening. We get equations that actually correspond to reality, and um, it's it works. So we do it. Um, in the next section, we'll cover what happens in conductors. So thanks for your time. If you have any questions, be sure to add comments below. Thanks for your time. Bye.